I will show you how to start publishing so many papers in Q1 journals that you will feel like you're cheating the system. Like one of our clients, Kathy, who published so many papers in 2025 that she has none left for 2026. That's what I call 1% researcher problems. Or Krzysztof, who 5x'd his output in just six months without working more. But before I give you this exact productivity playbook that helped Kati and Krzysztof and many of our other clients to really skyrocket their research paper output, we also need to tackle some of the biggest myths that are probably stopping you from really increasing your research paper output. First of all, I don't have time. Most researchers I speak to on a weekly basis always list this as one of the top bottlenecks blocking them from publishing more papers. But the truth actually is that lack of time is not a problem, it's a symptom of a disease. And the real problem or the real disease is that you don't manage your time well. The second big myth is that I need to wait until I collect all the data and analyze all of it before I start writing. And many researchers just get to this procrastination and postponement loop for months and months. And then what happens is that deadlines start looming large and they frantically write something at the very last minute. But what top researchers do is that they write every single week and they have a pipeline of research papers and they don't wait until the data has been analyzed or collected. And the third myth that many people think is actually blocking them from publishing more papers is that journals take too long to review the papers and respond to them. Now, it is true that journals do take months to review papers, but that's totally out of your control. And it's not the real issue here why you aren't publishing five or more papers in Q1 journals every year. What you need is a research paper pipeline so that as you're waiting for the response on paper one you're already writing paper two and collecting data on paper three and you've already designed paper four so now that we have these myths out of the way let me show you how to write so many research papers your colleagues will start wondering if you're actually cheating the system or maybe doing something illegal the very first thing that you really need to do is schedule blocks of time for writing or doing research related work. Think about it like this. If you have a lecture, that's going to go into your calendar. And if somebody wanted to book a meeting with you, like you're not just going to skip the lecture or leave it halfway through just because somebody else wants you to do something else. On the other hand, what happens with writing is that precisely people don't write because something else has come up that is very, very important. But you need to understand that the most important thing that you can be doing as a researcher is working on your research papers or grants. The only thing that you're going to be evaluated on or the most important thing that will allow you to become top 1% researcher is to have more research papers and more grants. And the way to do this is to write more. So if we know this to be true, well, writing needs to become a priority. It cannot be this random thing that you do at random hours in random places following a random process. Just like having a supervision meeting, just like giving a lecture to students, it needs to be in your calendar, it needs to be planned. And no matter what happens, you cannot cancel that meeting, just like you would not cancel a lecture with 100 students. That's the sort of mindset you want to get into. So stop this video right now and block writing slots in your calendar immediately. Now, the second thing is that you want to make these writing slots regular, even if it's just once a week, but really, you know, two or three times a week. And I say writing slots, but they can be also slots for reading the literature, conducting the experiments, any work related to your research paper, plan it in your calendar and make it regular. For example, every Monday and Wednesday from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., I'm working on my research papers. And it's blocked in your calendar so that when one of your colleagues wants to book a meeting with you or a student wants to do that, you're not available. You're busy. Your calendar is blocked. And if somebody asks you, well, are you available? Then you're not. That's the default answer. Because remember, again, publishing more papers or writing grants should be your number one priority if you truly want to advance your research career. And then number three, never multitask. 
please. It's a big myth that when we do more things at the same time, people think they are more productive. But it's your brain fooling you that you're more productive. Because what happens is that when you switch tasks and you start doing something new, that triggers dopamine and it feels pleasant. Because hard work for many hours on one single thing, it's painful. It takes a lot of effort. But that's really what it takes to achieve your goals. And when you start switching between the tasks, there's a very high cognitive cost to that. Because after switching, it might take you even 20 minutes, research shows, to refocus again and get into the flow again. So if you've scheduled a block of writing in which your goal is, for example, to finish the introduction to your paper, you must not now read other papers or check the data or check your emails or answer a phone call. You have to be writing for an hour or two hours or however many hours you schedule that. Now, point number four is that you really need to chunk things down. So a big problem that leads to a lot of overwhelm, stress, is that we have a big goal, like I want to publish three papers in Q1 journals in the next 12 months. But what people fail to do is to break down that big goal into intermediate goals and then very small daily actions that you can actually take. And research shows that the bigger the goal is and the more insurmountable it seems, the more likely we are to procrastinate and not do what we are supposed to do. On the other hand, if we break this big, seemingly insurmountable goal into small daily chunks, well, it's much easier to carry that out. To give you a more specific example, if you have a slot of one hour and your goal is to write the research gap and the aim for your paper, well, you'll be able to do that. And it doesn't feel that hard anymore, does it? But if your goal is simply, well, I need to finish my paper by December 25th, well, that, that feels really daunting, overwhelming and stressful. And it doesn't tell you what exactly you need to do. So when you're scheduling those slots, make sure that there's a very specific task. Which brings me to my next point that I have already mentioned, but it's super important. So I'm going to mention again, even if I sound like a broken record, prioritize. If writing your research paper or applying for grants is your priority, and it should be your priority, Priority. Because again, what do top universities evaluate you on? Sure, they take into account whether you're a good teacher, a lecturer, and you have positive reviews from students. But really, top professors get to their positions because they have published numerous papers every single year in absolutely top journals, and they have brought considerable amounts of money to the department through research grants. So if we know this to be true, writing grants, writing papers must become your priority. And this needs to be reflected in your calendar. A priority is the most important thing. And by definition, there can only be one priority. It's just in the last few decades that we've really changed the meaning of the word priority and put it in plurals. And people talk about the three priorities that they have. You cannot have three priorities. You can have one priority. And if it's your priority, it should be done first and it should take pre precedence over anything else. And I know this sounds tough, but this is what it takes to publish multiple papers every year while actually working less and enjoying the whole process more. And believe me, it's totally possible. Are you ready to implement these strategies to publish research papers in high impact journals in your discipline? Are you a professor, a researcher or a PhD student who would really like to advance their career, make a really big contribution to the field by publishing more papers in better journals while actually working less and enjoying the whole process? Then I've got really good news for you. I've just opened some slots in my calendar and you can book a free one-to-one -one consultation with me. Where we'll dive deeper and identify the specific challenge and bottleneck that is blocking you from achieving your full potential. And then we'll also clarify your goals. And then at the end, I'll outline an action plan for you that will help you to achieve all your academic goals, publish more papers and advance your career. If this sounds like something that you want to do, book the free one-to-one -one consultation right now. The link is in the description of this video. The next key point is the environment. That's why I actually moved here because 
in the previous space where I was recording, somebody interrupted me. And that shows you the importance of being in a place, especially when you want to do deep work and focus, where you cannot be interrupted. So if you share a co-working space, for example, with other people, that might not be a very conducive place to write, or writing in a cafeteria or a place like that where there is a lot of noise, it's likely not going to work. So if you have your own office, what I would do is just lock the door of your office and put a do not disturb notice so that nobody actually disturbs you. And you might seem funny, but that's what actually some really top researchers do when they want to truly focus on the writing and do deep work. And there are also other considerations to make in terms of the environment. For example, research shows that open spaces are more conducive to creative thinking. There's this thing called cathedral effect. So what I found worked really well for me when I was doing my PhD and I really had to produce a lot of writing very quickly, I would go to a park and find a quiet bench with nobody around where I could be more creative and write more. And the added bonus of that was that there was no internet in the park so I couldn't self-sabotage myself and get distracted. So the environment is hugely important. Now the next tip is very obvious, but most people fail to do this, and it is focus. The definition of focus is to do the thing that you are supposed to do and nothing else. So I know it's very simple, but it's actually really hard to do. That's why this environment is so important for you. You want to put yourself in a place where there is just one thing to do and it's almost physically impossible to do anything else but the thing that you want to do. So that's focus. Another tip to help you with that is notifications. So you want to get rid of all notifications that you might have on your laptop or maybe on your mobile phone because these notifications are terribly distracting. And you can tell yourself that you can fight off these notifications and you're not going to check them. But just the mere fact of having that notification noise or pop-up distracts your brain and it adds to your cognitive load because inevitably, subconsciously, you will be thinking about that notification even if you don't follow through and check it. So get rid of all notifications. I, I go to a point where I have no notifications on my phone. The only ones that I get are from my wife when she calls me and there's nothing else. Like that's how far you want to go if you want to really maximize your output and focus better. And then the next tip is also very simple and it is just simply to show up. You cannot lose if you don't give up. So show up consistently every day, every week, every month. If you look at the most successful people throughout history, be they researchers, business people, sports people, you will notice this pattern that they show up every single day, no matter what day of the week it is, no matter whether it's the sun is shining or it's raining, no matter whether they feel motivated or really discouraged, they show up every single day. Because the truth is that if you want to achieve extraordinary results, you need to do extra things that ordinary people would find weird and would never do. That's the definition of extraordinary. So make sure you show up. And then also, please start early. So a big issue I see with a lot of researchers who come to us for support is that they wait for months you know, thinking that they should start writing when they finally have more time, when they're not teaching and the semester has finished, when they have collected the data, when they have analyzed the data, when they have read more literature. There are all sorts of different excuses that many researchers make up for themselves to justify why they're not writing. But the harsh truth is that these are just excuses. For example, you can be writing the introduction of your paper before you've ever collected the data. You don't need to wait until the end. And by doing that, you create a pipeline. If you think of an assembly line for a car, do you think they wait to assemble the whole car once they have all the pieces? Of course not. If you're waiting until the very end to start writing, you're going to have less time, you're going to feel more stressed, and you're going to produce suboptimal work. And then the next tip is to please, please deal with the perfectionist delusion. I know that you want to write a really good paper, but you don't write a perfect or a great paper by aiming for perfection. Perfection or greatness is achieved through a series of mediocre steps. All those papers that you see published in Nature or other top 1% journals, they started as really crap drafts. And before they got to that great point, you know, the researcher carried out 
the tasks that they had to, they wrote and they showed up and they were consistent about it. And they didn't aim for perfection. They aimed for good enough and to finish the task that was on the calendar. And that's exactly what you need to do as well. So now that you know exactly how to be more productive and really skyrocket your research paper output, you also need to learn how to write research papers to the standard required of you by those top Q1 journals, because otherwise your papers will still get rejected or you'll get major, major revisions, which means you'll get bogged down for months responding to reviewers' comments and resubmitting your papers when you could be producing more papers. That's why in this next video, I show you exactly how to write research papers for Q1 journals better than 90% of other researchers. So watch this video next to increase your chances of your paper being accepted.